let's all stand and uh, Brother Vic is going to lead us through the wonderful grace of Jesus. Brother Vic can come up here and lead us to a song. 355. From our hymnals, 355. Wonderful grace of Jesus, let's sing. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. I shall be start off with a scripture out of the book of Revelation chapter 4. Brother Denson dealt with this a little bit and touched my heart today. The Bible says this in verse number 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's the purpose why we were made. The purpose is to please the Lord. And that's why we're here this evening. And it's all about him. We have an audience of one. I'd like to ask Pastor Boy Saga to come and lead us to a word of prayer. Pastor Boy Saga got saved in the Philippines. 
some of you might know Brother Burden uh, Carter. He was a professor at Heartland Baptist Bible College. I sat in his class when he taught the book of Revelations. And the ministry that he inherited was from Brother Carter. And uh, they're a missionary that went to the Philippines. I think that that's the greatest investment that America ever did, was send missionaries to the Philippines. And they're now the church there is thriving. They're in Takuling, Bacolod, and um, Bible Baptist Church. And I had the privilege of preaching there in 2016. And God has just used him in a great way. So Pastor Boy, you come over here and lead us a word of prayer. Well, uh, pleasant evening to everyone. And my heart uh, really do rejoice of uh, this kind of gathering. I am really delighted. And I would like to bring greetings from Bible Baptist Church, Bacolod City, to the lovely people here, and to my beloved uh, missionaries and pastors. You know what? I have lots of things to say, but I will need two before we pray. Number one, I would like to apologize to the American brethren because some of your servicemen in the Longapo are victimized by us. Before I was saved, I was once of this nature and belonged to one of the notorious gangs in the Longapo. And many of the poor businessmen were victimized by us. And that's, that is where I apologize. And number two, I have something to be grateful of our lovely people here in America. Uh, because through you, you give us freedom. I am a little bit uh, emotional now. Uh, Brother Larry knew about this because uh, we are uh, co-members of Bible Baptist Church, uh, Longapo. Uh, you give us freedom. You liberated us, helping Filipinos hand in hand, side by side, to free from you know our invaders. And therewith, we are so thankful. And let us give glory to God for that. Amen. And number, number two, which is most important, you give us our spiritual freedom. Amen. I was saved in Bible Baptist Church in Longapo City under the leadership of our beloved, handsome pastor, Reverend Brebinido Abrira. But I was brought up from the training of Dr. Damon Woods in Pine City Bible Baptist College. And for 40 years of the ministry, I always remember all the things that was taught to us as Bible Baptists. I was surrounded by these contemporary Christians in our cities. But praise unto God because of your teachings to us that we need to stand for the cause of Jesus Christ. You give us our social freedom. And most of all, you give us our spiritual freedom. We were able to speak in English. We, were edu we educated ourselves because of our American missionaries. And the read my friend, praise be unto God. Amen. And all the things that you endeavor for us, someday God reward you for that. And allow us me to pray right now. Our blessed Lord and gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts do rejoice in the things you have given us. There are times, Lord, that we are a little bit emotional, but Lord, thanks be unto you. You save people, Lord. You change the lives of people. You, you change us and you save souls. And there with Lord, we have lots of things to thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the eternal life that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance. But most of all, Lord, we thank you not only, Lord, of these things, but because of who and what you are in our lives. Be with us, Lord, the rest of the conference. And thanks be unto you. And we have lots of things, Lord, to us, but thou knowest the Lord God. Be with us, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. May be seated.
loot, the loot for sale. Come buy the loot, the loot for sale. Ito ang aking sari-sari, may mga kaldiro at walis, pots and brooms for sale. My dear Lorraine, welcome to the Philippines. Yes, the Lord God has been good to us, allowing you to pastor in Texas, Kansas, and Amen. Louisiana, now calling us to be missionaries in the Philippines. Amen. Amen. Well, let's see what we got over here. Ah, you're American. I will sell to you my pots and brooms. It's, it's buy one, take one free. <laughs> so buy my pot, and I'll give you the cover for free. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. What would you say if I was willing to offer you something for free? Don't have to pay for it. Can't earn it. Can't purchase it. What would you say to that? That sounds like a great gift. Yes. It is. And, it, and it's called salvation. Salvation is eternity in heaven, but only for those people who have put their trust, faith, and belief in Jesus Christ. You see, when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, that entitles you to go to heaven for eternity. And you don't have to spend eternity in hell. Let me show you here real quick. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Thus begins the work of Pastor Edwin Fred Null and his wife, Mrs. Bertha Lorene Null called by God to take over a small mission work in Mandaluyong Rizal. Bible Baptist Church of Mandaluyong started with 12 members, but within a year moved into a new building and had 200 people in Sunday school on the first service. A Bible seminary was also started to train young men and women desiring to serve the Lord full time. For almost three decades, Pastor and Mrs. Null served faithfully, starting at least 25 independent Baptist churches. However, in 1977, Pastor Null suffered a massive stroke, causing him to be permanently paralyzed on his right side. Meanwhile, across the sea, the Lord God was continuing to do his work in the heart of a young sailor. You know, it's nice to hear the sounds of the ocean and the waves. But sometimes, I like to hear the voices of my, my mother, my father, and even my siblings. Yes, you get lonely here sometimes. But, um, can I share something with you? Yeah. Did you know that there's someone who is always with you no matter where you are? In fact, this book tells us that neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, Amen. which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In September 1977, Larry Obero accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Unable to continue his work in the Philippines due to his massive stroke, Pastor and Mrs. Null returned to the United States. It was during this time that the Lord showed them the work which they must now do, reaching the Filipinos in San Diego, California. With 50 members, the Filipino Bible Baptist Church of National City was started on July 10, 1983. Two of its members were Larry and Myrna Obero. Pastor and Mrs. Null worked tirelessly to reach souls for Christ. Before Pastor Null's death on January 25, 1992, he committed his work to Pastor Larry Obero, who by God's grace, faithfully pastored Bible Baptist Church for 33 years. Today, the ministry of Pastor Fred Null continues to impact the lives of Filipinos on both sides of the Pacific Ocean, along with many lives touched by those missionaries supported by Bible Baptist Church. As Pastor Null often stated from one of his favorite poems, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last.
Let us remain standing. Turn to him as to him number 101. We have a story to tell to the nation. 101. Let's sing the first verse. We have a story to tell to the nation that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of good and mercy. A story of peace and life. A story of peace and life. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning The second with a song to be sung to the nation that shall lift their hearts to the Lord, a song that shall conquer evil and shatter the fear and sword, and shatter the fear and sword, for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawn. A Savior to show to the nation who the path of sorrow had trod, that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God, for the darkness shall come to dawning and the dawn. Singing, you may be seated, please. What a blessing to sing to the Lord. The Bible says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. Come before his presence with singing. And definitely, if you're saved, you ought to be singing unto the Lord. What a blessing it is to hear the choir. I've got a big, great job in that. And give all the praises to the Lord. He deserves it, definitely. Well, since it is an emphasis on missions and the truth endured to all generations, God had used missionaries throughout the world. We do have a missionary tonight. I'd like to ask Pastor Dick Webster to come up here and introduce the missionary. As well, Pastor Dick Webster is director of the Global Independent Baptist Missions. Pastor Webster, you come up here. Well, if your heart hadn't been blessed already, you're just in trouble. That's all I got to tell you. What a joy it is to uh, represent missionaries. And I'm going to have a uh, uh, standing pastor. Missionary, come on up here while I'm saying what I got to say. I uh, want to uh, thank uh, Brother Hardy. Uh, some time ago, uh, Dave calls me and asks me for a steak all the time. And, and uh, he always asks me when he's somebody at place else. But uh, he knows. I did buy him one, but I'm going to buy him more. I, uh, I love Brother and Sister Hardy. But some time ago, he put a bug in my ear. And I didn't pay much attention to him because he's always bugging me. But... Uh, he told me that I ought to be praying for military missions. And uh, so I, the second time he asked me, I won't say I did the first time, the second time he asked me to, I actually started doing it. Can I tell you, if you pray about something, you will get a burden for it. And so uh, he introduced us to, last time we had our first military missions for the Global Independent Baptist Mission and uh, Brother Gary Kraft, and tonight we have our second. And it would be okay with me if we had one every time. Amen. Folks, this is the most wonderful untapped missions in the world. And then you see what they do when they get excited about Jesus. Amen. If you can't see that, it's just a wonderful thing. So we brother have Brother Clint Minnick and his lovely wife are here tonight, and uh, we have... Uh, uh, met with them and we love them and we're thanking God for them. They are starting a church in 29 Palms, California, right outside of one of the training bases 
uh, in California, and they primarily have military people. Uh, and uh, we saw his burden last night in the director's meeting. He got us all crying. <clears throat> he loves the military guys and girls. And uh, I, I want him to introduce to his pastor. This is Brother Aaron Shipman. Uh, he pastors the Bible Baptist Church in Odessa. He got the burden together with them, and uh, they went out there, and they're starting this church. And uh, I've come to this conclusion. If we're going to start military churches, we've got to do it on purpose. Amen. And that means we've got to do what is necessary to get the job done. God's opened some wonderful doors for this couple already. They have the opportunity to already put the, uh, uh, the paperwork in to buy a Seventh-day Adventist building in that town. Now, you know we're in California Five acres and a building for $150,000. You think God's not in that, you don't know anything about California. So I'm going to have his pastor come and introduce him. Uh, this is Brother Aaron Shipman. He, uh, I'll just go ahead and say he's also one of my preacher boys. So. But I'm not responsible for his bad behavior. Okay. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, I was standing in a meeting and I was listening to Brother Dave Hardy talk to a few others and I heard him say this, uh, he said, what we're doing for military missions is not enough. And I put that in my memory bank and then uh, we partnered with uh, Brother Minnick and we started the church there in 29 Palms and I was driving out to 29 Palms. Now let me tell you, 29 Palms is not San Diego. It's just not. Um, you don't see the beautiful landscape, the water, none of that. Uh, in fact, you go out and you see uh, it's basically military training. And, uh, but what it did do for me when I got to his church and I watched how that Brother and Mrs. Minnick interacted with uh, the people, uh, I figured out really quickly that Brother and Mrs. Minnick, this is what God called them to do. And uh, I would ask you to do two things as I look at our um, situation. Number one, a building for $150,000 in California is uh, unheard of. And God gave that to us. And I would ask you, we're going to have to come up with $30,000 uh, to get the down payment on that. And then it's going to need some TLC. Uh, could be upwards of about $50,000 to take care of that. Uh, I'd ask you to consider preachers to uh, get on board with us and help us out with this. Not every day a, a building drops in your lap, and I'm, I know Brother Minnett's excited. Uh, it's, he's excited about that. Uh, but secondly, I would say this: get on board. He needs to be. He needs to have full time support, and uh, that's what we're here for. I promise you, Brother Minnick is one of the hardest working. Uh, kids, I know. I mean, I'm telling you, he has been there. He loses three families a month. And he still averages 65. I, I, I'm going to tell you, it's just amazing. So uh, here they are, Brother and Mrs. Minnick. So uh, my name is uh, Clint Minnick, and this is my, my wife, Maureen. We have uh, four little ones and one on the way. We have Preston, Ashlyn, Lacey, and Brinley, and the little one on the way. If any of you give me $20,000, I'll name our new next child after you. For that. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll have my wife. I'm... I'm being serious. Uh, 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 so, uh, anyhow, so uh, do we have any takers? Uh, but really and truly, I'll have my wife uh, give a word of testimony, and then I'll talk for a second. Well, I had the opportunity of not only growing up in a Christian home, but in a ministry home. And my dad is also an Air Force veteran. And the Lord called him to preach while he was in the military. So he taught us to love the Lord and love our country. So... You don't see it growing up, what the Lord does to prepare you for the ministry. He's called you to later. But it's, it's been a blessing to see um, those early years of forming my thoughts and my, my viewpoints towards the Lord and towards our country to be able to serve these people in the military. And it's just an honor. We feel like we say more goodbyes than hellos, but it's so neat to see where they, they are when they come and then where they are when we send them off to serve in another church. And it's, it's, it's just a great blessing. And so we're thankful for those of you who have partnered with us. We couldn't do it without you, and we're so thankful for you. Thank you. So um, 
like a preacher said, 29 Palms is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Um, I was texting uh, a young man that's a student at Heartland Baptist Bible College. He was in the Navy. His name is Chesley. Um, he's uh, from Pastor Chadwick's church. I was texting him, just letting him know. I was thinking about him. And he said, hey, Brother Minnick, how's Afghanistan? Um, because in 29 Palms, that's what they do. They prepare those Marines for desert warfare training. And so there's many schoolhouses on the base. It's a, it's a barren, forgotten little city. Really, if the base wasn't there, there'd be no city. There's 25,000 people in the population if you do the Wikipedia or the Google search of the city. But of that 25,000, 12,000 of them are Marines, and then they're dependents. They're, so you have a wife and then all their little ones. And so in the midst of that, God has begun to do an incredible thing. And in the last three and a half years, we've had over 250 young men and ladies that have come into our door, started to grow, get excited about the Lord, get plugged in, and then they get new orders. Our, listen, who wants to retire to 29 Palms? Um, the Marines call it Satan's sandbox or the stumps. They, they hate it. There's no, I, I don't blame them to not want to retire to 29 Palms. Um, you can ask Brother Keith Drankard. He's been to 29 Palms and our preacher and anyone else who's ever been to 29 Palms. Even if you're from California, you've never been to 29 Palms. Um, <laughs> Thanks a lot. They, they, you drive by the sign and it's like, hey, we saw the sign. Listen, that sign is an hour and a half from our house, okay? Come up and see us, all right? Just <laughs> say hi. Um, you'd probably double your support. Um, even we had Brother uh, Alex Buford come in and he said, Brother Minnick, they do live fire, right? That's what you were telling me. And I said, yes, sir. He said, do they do that on the buildings in town? I said, no, that's just on the base. So that just helps you understand a little bit of our dynamic in our city. But God has begun to do some incredible things in many, many hearts and many, many lives. But I want you to, to know what God is doing. Right now, we're, we're starting a Bible study on the base. If you're connected and understand military missions, that's absurd. That's, that's, that does not happen. But we're starting a Bible study in the barracks with uh, one of our young men. We're, we're starting discipleship with our young guys. It's Amen. exciting what God is doing. And I want you to, to pray and ask God to, to work in your heart. Even this young man, his name, is, uh, his name is Lucas Jeffers. He came to me about a month ago, and he said, Preacher, I've been... I've been trying to be Jonah. I joined the Marine Corps because I didn't want to surrender to preach. But God's getting a hold of my life. I can't run from it. I don't want to, I don't want to end up in the belly of the well. And this young man, Lucas, surrendered his life to full-time ministry. And he's serving and ministering. But because of his stand, um, Lucas is a Daniel in a wicked, wicked place. They, just because these young men have a sharp haircut and they can say yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, does not mean anything. They are morally wicked aboard that base. And so they persecute this young man. And because of that, they said, well, you don't drink and you don't cuss. We'll get you to cuss. And they choked out Lucas. He wouldn't cuss. He stood firm. And they said, well, Lucas, we're going to give you a bath since you stink. And they drank. They poured alcohol all over this young man. But because he retained his integrity, last Sunday, he, him and his Marines, his battalion was in the field. And they, they said, you know, Jeffers, it's Sunday. We're so, we, you know you want to be at church. Why don't you preach to all of us? And so Lucas opened up John 3.16 and preached the gospel to his entire battalion. And so God is blessing and working. We have another young, uh, another man in our church. His name's uh, David Collum. David um, David's a warrant officer three. Uh, if you know the Marine Corps, warrant officers are rare. But Brother David has a call to preach in his life. He's already gone through Bible college, through um, uh, Liberty University. But we're practically training him in the ministry and teaching him some of those things about uh, what it is to serve and minister that way. And Lord willing, in three years, we'll send Brother David off. But God is doing some amazing things, and so I want to ask you to just open up your heart. I know it's a unique ministry. I know it's an outpost, but good night. Those young men, let me echo what Brother, uh, Brother Hardy said. Those young men need a church, and what we do is we do our best to create a place to call home. And so if you have your, you know, you have your Bible and you have your margin, a margin's great. You need margin, but our ministry, we thin the margin. We become mom and dad a lot of times to these young men so that they have accountability, so they have encouragement. Even today, they were the, the guys were texting, our Pastor, can we come over today? I'm like, guys, I'm out of town. And they're all, well, we don't want to talk to you today then, you know. But right now, there's about 20 of them that are praying for this meeting, praying that God would get a hold of your lives and God would speak to you about our ministry. But it's pretty amazing. Um, I got saved as a little bus kid um, down in Ontario, California. And the man that led me to the Lord was Brother Carlos' brother-in-law. 
one of Brother Larry's preacher boys, Brother Jane Epimaceno. It's amazing how God works in full circle. And then I, when I was a senior in high school, I moved up and went to, uh, I moved to Yakima. I went to Brother Brown's church. And we went to college days and Brother McCracken and Brother Davison were preaching. And I, I said, man, if God could use Brother McCracken, God could use me. <laughs> so thank you, Brother McCracken. And I surrendered my life to preach. And uh, the neat thing is when we went and took our survey trip, Brother McCracken's daughter and son, uh, son-in-law, they watched our kiddos and took care of them. But it's amazing to be able to have this full circle. But I want to ask you men to pray for us and, and partner with us. So that's all I have to say. Come on, guys. Let's help this guy. Can you sense his heart? He had all of our directors right in the palm of his hand last night. <laughs> I see his heart. I hope you do. What a blessing. Encouraged to hear that uh, how God is using uh, Brother Clint there in the military, reaching the Marines. Think about some of my relatives that are Marines serving their country as well. Sounds like some centurions are there. Amen. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it sounds like they need to get saved. So. I was about to support him until he mentioned my brother-in-law there for a minute. <laughs> so, so I have to pray a little bit more. <laughs> no, I like to tell our church family we will get behind Brother Clint. I'll ask him to come back here and present his work. And uh, we're behind you, Brother Clint. And definitely the, the sailors here agree those Marines need the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> all right. Let's all stand. We're going to sing a song. We're going to sing Jesus Saves. We're going to sing all four stanzas. And the big last part, we just sing a cappella. Okay. 281. 281. 281. Let's sing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward these our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let's sing the second. Wrap it on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell the sinner far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back the ocean gates, earth shall keep her to believe, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let's sing the third, sing above the battle strike, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, singing softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves, singing triumph for the soul, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Now let's sing the last a cappella. Give the wings a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shall salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. These are songs of victory. singing this evening. Pastor Monette, pastors up there in Canada, I'd like him to come over here and say a word of prayer about the offering as well. Thank you, Pastor. Always good to be here, praise the Lord. Great hosts, aren't they? Amen. We've heard singing in Tagalog, Spanish, English. I'll greet you in French. Bonsoir tout le monde. But I'm not going to sing. 
Well, uh, we've been well fed. They took care of all the meals. So far for us, we know how much it costs to go to restaurants. And God tells us to let our love be without dissimulation. And we're to prove the sincerity of our love. This is a great occasion for us to do that if uh, we want to express our gratitude for a great host church. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for uh, the occasion to be here and for those that were able to make it. What a blessing to be among the brethren and to encourage each other in the battle. And Lord God, we trust that you will make provision uh, for the needs of this church as you've provided also for each one their spiritual needs. And Lord God, certainly many more wished they would have been here to hear the preaching and see their meet, their needs met also. And so Lord, we pray that you be with everyone that um, gives their all in the ministry to serve you. You're so worthy of it. Help us now to have a heart to express the sincerity of our love and help this church to remove a little bit of the burden in Christ's name. Amen. Ashley, appreciate Brother Ashley. Brother Ashley is uh, actually a military kid. His dad served in the United States Navy for several many years. Faithfully served the Lord here as well, Bible Baptist Church. I'd like to introduce to you our preacher tonight. Uh, our preacher, when he started to preach here, his hair was a lot darker. <laughs> now it's a lot whiter. But McCracken has been preaching here for, I believe, 27 years. We just tried to calculate the numbers real quickly. And... Uh, the three men that are preaching here every night, and even the one in the mornings, 
they have a special part of Bible Baptist Church that I, I brought him intentionally or asked him to preach intentionally because, uh, number one, I think the Lord laid that on my heart. But the second thing is that they have a great heritage with this church or they have a great relationship. And I don't want our church, Bible Baptist Church, to forget that heritage and the truth that had endured to all generations. So we appreciate that. So um, Brother McCracken is going to come up here and preach the Word of God, and definitely it's a delight to have him here. And also, I had to ask Pastor Ribeiro to come up here and sing. And with his wife, Sister Myrna. So uh, Sister Myrna and Pastor Barrow is going to sing a song that uh, Brother Vic and uh, Pastor had talked about singing. It's looking, I'm looking forward for this song. Pastor, appreciate you. When Brother Minnick said that uh, if Brother McCracken can, can be used of God, he can be used of God too, it reminded me what Pastor Nal used to challenge us as young men. He said, if God can use a null, that means zero. He can use anyone. And I am so thankful because that challenge cost me when he asked me to pray about being trained by him to take over this work. I am thankful that Amen. I surrendered and my wife followed Amen. my faith. Later on in life, I challenged the young people in this church. I figured out that Fred Nall is a zero, but then I figure out my name is Obero. Zero at the beginning and zero at the ending. <laughs> it's a double zero. <laughs> and if God could use a double zero, he could use anybody. In fact, our young people appreciated that and they bought me a jersey. I never played basketball, but they bought me a jersey. If you could go to the gym, there's a jersey on top of that clock. It says Obero double zero. <laughs> I pray that that will be a challenge to them, that God can use them. We used to visit Pastor Nal as he's training me, helping him, my wife with Mrs. Nal, and several other couples here. There's a, 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 a plaque hanging on his wall. It said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And he always challenges us also. I want to stand before Jesus Christ to hear him say, well done, the good and faithful servant. Tonight I'm grateful that they, my wife and I can sing only one life. It matters so little how much you may own the places you've been or people you've known for it all comes to nothing when placed at his feet it's nothing to jesus just memories to keep Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one chance to do His will. So give to Jesus all. It's the only life that pays If you recall you have but one life You may take all the treasures From far away lands Take all the riches you can hold And take all the pleasures your money can buy. But what will you have when it's your time to die? 
The days pass so swiftly And months come and go The years melt away Like new fallen snow Spring turns to summer And summer to fall Autumn brings winter Then death comes to call Only one life So soon it will pass Only what's done for Christ will It's the only life that plays when you recall you have but one life. When you recall you have but one Well, thank you very, very much, Double Zero. <laughs> My soul, he got a new nickname. I agree with Brother Webster. If you're not moved, uh, you're dead. <laughs> My heart is full, and I'm, yes. I'm, I'm humbled to think that. Uh, 27 years ago, a little more than that, actually, that I met Brother Obero up on the mountain. And, uh, and he would allow me to come and preach when we were down at Chula Vista. And then he would ask me to come back. <laughs> and again, and again. The first time I preached over in Chula Vista, the building was full, just like this is full. It was just smaller, just crammed in there. And I, it's my first time to preach to a, mainly a Filipino crowd and congregation. And I'm telling you, I would preach like I preach, and I'd preach serious and hard and talk about sanctification and so on. And, Men would say amen, but I'm telling you, there was four or five or six or eight elderly women that are on the sides going, that's right, preach, say it again. And I'm going, okay, I will. <laughs> that's a blessing. That's a help. Preach to some of you guys, and you sit there and going, okay, what? But give me a room full of Filipino women that love Jesus, I might pass out. Before I forget, I need to say, hi, Nancy. I love you. It's my first time here without you. And these people love you. They have spoken about you. They're praying for you. Amen. Let's uh, turn our Bibles to the book of Acts, please. Acts chapter 13. If you're able, I invite you to stand, please. <clears throat> We stand to give reverence and to give honor to the eternal, infallible, inerrant. It's the perfect, preserved word of the living God. If anybody ought to honor and respect this book, 
It ought to be people that know Jesus. <clears throat> Chapter 13 of Acts and verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. I'd like to pray with you, please, and I'd appreciate it if you'd pray for God to have his way. Our great God, I come to you again and just want to give you all the glory and praise and honor. You alone are worthy. Lord, I'm grateful to be here at this meeting and how you've touched me and blessed me yesterday and this morning and tonight, what we've already experienced. Thank you. Thank you that it's real. It's not some philosophical ideology. <laughs> But it's real. And I give you praise for that. Lord, I'm asking uh, for help tonight. You're well aware I uh, am nothing. and I need you. So I ask you for unction and power and ability to get across your truth tonight. Illumine my heart and mind and tongue and then illumine all of our hearts to hear it, and that we're not resisting, that we're open and ready, then God, we'd be sensitive to you as you speak to us, and if there are things that you're working in our hearts about, that we won't fight that, we will say yes to whatever you speak to us about, and of course, Christ, if there are anyone here tonight that's not yet saved, would you... In your great love and compassion, would you touch them and bring conviction on their soul and their need? Tonight would be the night that they would say yes to you and receive your forgiveness. God, if you're calling servants to your work, I pray they hear you. They wouldn't push it away. They'd say yes to your call tonight. Lord, I ask you to strengthen your people tonight. I pray that it would accomplish your will. God, truly, we do want you to get all the glory. So, God, we look forward to what you might accomplish. So thank you in advance for what you've already done, but thank you in advance for what you're about to do. So we give you a praise and glory. And it's in the mighty and holy name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I know that it doesn't matter to you, but when... When a preacher is trying to prepare a, a message to deliver, there's a myriad of approaches and coming to the text and so on. And uh, anyway, I've known for months that I was going to be looking at this text, and I was pretty sure I already had it all ready, and I was look, ready. And then as I began to prepare and write and so on, uh, other things would pop up. And uh, anyway, by God's grace, uh, I'm, one of the texts here, uh, there are several things that pop up uh, right away in the text. Uh, and I, I want us to be sure that we have awareness of 
of these things that pop up. And there's a whole lot in the, these three verses. It's a whole lot. But uh, just one of the things I'm going to make emphasis on, it says the church that was at Antioch. So there's a whole lot of weight right there. <laughs> Then another thing that pops up here, it says, uh, it gives their names and so on, it says that they, they ministered to the Lord. I think it's fascinating, it didn't say they ministered for the Lord, they ministered to. In my head, when I think of ministering to, when I minister to someone at the hospital, when I minister to someone in their home, that I'm, I'm coming there to, to assist them, to aid them, to help them. But I can't assist God. I can't help him. I can't aid him. So what, would, what, what is it that I would minister to the Lord? And so as you lengthen or stretch out the definition, it, it includes uh, serving. I am serving the Lord. Most of us have been to restaurants, and it's a blessing when you get a good server. Some of them you go, uh, they're good at this. And some of them you're going, they need to find their real job. <laughs> this ain't it. And when we serve the Lord, wouldn't it be grand if the Lord would say, you're a good servant. Amen. That's right. the ministering to the Lord. Another thing that jumps off the page, it says they fasted. That's not hard to get. People that don't even attend church know that fasting means you don't eat. It says the Holy Ghost. That could be an entire week of study. Tonight I'm only going to say that the Holy Ghost is the third person of the triune God. He's co-equal. He's co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son. He's God. Another thing that comes off the page is separate. Me, Barnabas, and Saul. It's not too hard to capture. Separate. Separate. Another way we would say it is set apart. Evidently, they're, they're in the group, and they go, now, 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 here's what I want to do. I, I've called Barnabas and Saul. I want to separate them, set them apart. And then it says, for the work. Evidently, there's some activity. You know, evidently, there's going to be some effort that the Holy Ghost wants done. So there's lots of, each one of these could be a subject for preaching. Tonight, I, my, my goal anyway, my intent, is I, I want to talk about two of them. I want to talk about the church and the work. God allowed me a few weeks ago to get to be with two of my favorite people and favorite preachers. I got to be with Brother Sam Davison and Brother Dave Hardy. Us three were together for four days, and it was a blessing. I've been burdened for years at our churches. The ones I go to, the only kind I go to is independent, fundamental, God-fearing, devil hate, and Bible-believing Baptist churches. That's where I go. But in our churches, if you gave a quiz, what do we believe? Why are we independent Baptist? Why are we like we are that we say no to this? No, we won't accept that. No, why is it? What is our doctrine of ecclesiology? And if we gave a quiz, the majority of our church members wouldn't have a clue. 
I know, I know. You say, well, not my church. My people know everything. <laughs> well, good for you. But our church members that attend our churches leave our churches by the dozens, and they go to something that we consider is not even close to a church. Our young people leave, and they go to these places. I'm wondering, what is wrong? So with, I told you I was with these favorite people of mine, and I said, there's only 52 weeks in a year. How often should we preach about the church that our people can get it? Because the Bible is like big. There's a lot of other stuff in there. Since you brought it up, somehow or another we mentioned tithing more than once a year. We mentioned witnessing. Somehow we put it in there more than once a year. Is anybody hearing anything? I'm saying? Now, I do believe in expositional preaching. I believe that's how the Bible was written. That's how we need to learn it and understand it. But there are other avenues of preaching, and they're not inappropriate. They're not wrong. But somehow or another, you, you need to get it in your head and heart that the church has a great value. Amen. And if our people don't know why we are what we are, we ought not be surprised if they go, eh, that's not that big a deal, I'll go over there. It is a big deal. Amen. I want to talk about the church tonight and the work. I guess I was going to start like this. The Acts of the Apostles is a transitional record. It transitions between the historical account called the Gospels and the epistles to our Lord's churches. The Gospels give the history of our Savior's first coming. The epistles give history and illustration and instructions concerning the life and the duty of the Lord's churches. The Gospels tell of his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ministry. In John 1, it says that our Lord came to his own, and his own received him not. Our Savior's ministry and his work was to his own people, the Jews. And yet they rejected him. That was his work, that was his ministry. And they said no. Jesus did not quit. He did not give up. He did not stop his ministry. He had a plan already in place. The book of Ephesians says that it was a mystery. It means it wasn't known. It wasn't expected. I, 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 don't know. I know the mystery in Ephesians is a husband and wife relationship and how that you know, illustrates Christ and his church relationship. I know it's mainly talking about that kind of union, but it, it carries more weight than just that. I think it's also correct to say that the church itself was unexpected. It was an unknown. And how Ephesians says it, this is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and his church. So I think it's correct to say that this church, it was unknown. It was unexpected. See, there was no one on the planet that was expecting Jesus, the Messiah, to show up and then leave. Oh, no, they were looking for the Messiah, but they thought he would stay and set up his kingdom. Our Savior's plan wasn't known or expected. His plan was that he would start his church and commission his church to continue his work, and he would leave. But he promised, I'm coming back. 
Amen. So the first part I want to look at is the Lord's work. What was his work? What is this work they were called to do? Well, they're called uh, to do his work. So what was his work? The Lord said uh, in the Hebrews, it says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. The Lord Jesus, his work was, and I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do. I'm going to do what's on the agenda. I'm going to do. No, no. He did say, if it be thy will, let this come. Nevertheless, not my will. That's what he came to do. The angel told Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what he came to do. That was his work. Timothy says this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was his work. Jesus himself said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his Son to be the propitiation for our sin. For, for our sins, Jesus came to be the propitiation. That was part of his work, this propitiation. He's going to make satisfactory, satisfactory reparations for our sins. To extinguish the guilt by compensation or by atonement so you and I could be forgiven. What did he do? He pays for our sins. That's what the Bible says in Corinthians. It says Christ died for our sins. This morning the young people gave a skit concerning William Carey. I'm not positive I have the quote correct. But how I heard it and how I wrote it down, it moved me. Carey asked those people that didn't want to get involved in missions, is Jesus life worth more than the life of others? Because Christ died for our sins. If he died for our sins, if I got the picture right, Carrie is saying, if he died, are you going to say that we're not going to use the worth of his life and their life is not worth hearing about the Savior? That's the whole reason he came, to seek and to save. Another part of Jesus' work is evident. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. I'm pretty sure the word build in kind of gives the meaning that he's going to have to work. It takes effort to build. In fact, he himself is the chief cornerstone. So what is the Savior's work? I know there's much more than this, but I am trying to press it down or whittle it down to just get some thought here that Christ's work, he came to do his Father's will. He came to pay sinners' sin debt and to save them from their sins. He came to call sinners to repentance. He came to build his church. Now the Savior's gone. That was unexpected. But his work is to go on. Amen. So this work that the Holy Ghost called Barnabas and Saul to do, this work is to continue the work of the Savior. That's what the work is. What was the work of the Savior? Seeking to save. Build his church. Can somebody say amen? amen. Mercy. I don't think we should get too mixed up here. I don't think we ought to be going, I don't know what to do. (laughs) Barnabas and Saul going, now he wants to do what work? 
No, they are to participate in the seeking and the saving of sinners. They're to participate in the building of His church. That's His work. So, hopefully we've got enough done on the work. I want to talk about the church. It's called the church that was at Antioch. So, I think this is kind of obvious. It was local. It was specific. It's in a place. Uh, Antioch. I mean, nobody should be going, well, I don't get that. What is the church, though? The church, which was at Antioch. You know, though, Word church is only two times in the gospel. Both of those times are in Matthew. It's 18 times in the book of Acts. In the rest of the epistles, it's 59 times. But the first time that they ever heard the word church, Matthew 16. In red letters, Jesus said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now listen carefully. Upon this rock, let me just tell you, Peter is not the rock. He's not even close to Gibraltar. He's a little tiny pebble. He ain't the rock. But what Peter said is the rock. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the rock. That validates who Jesus is. That validates His church. Upon this rock, upon this truth, I am the Son of God. I will build my church. <laughs> oh, there's another obvious here. It's his church. <laughs> Did anybody get that? He started it. He builds it. He protects it. He owns it. He purchased it. It's his church. It's not yours. It's never been yours. And it never will be. It's not yours to do with as you please. It's not yours to decide how are you going to do his work. It's his church. I'm telling you, that would solve a lot of problems. There would be a lot of stuff that would smooth out if people would go, this isn't my church. Jesus, this is yours. This is your work. Excuse me, he didn't leave us without instructions. He didn't start it and go, do the best you can, boys. So the church defined historically, biblically. We know the word church is ecclesia. It's called out assembly. You're right. People go, uh, how come it says church? Because when you translate ecclesia into English, it's church. <laughs> it's a called out assembly, his church. Wait a minute, there are all kinds of called out assemblies. They have the school assembly, they call them out from the classrooms and come and all assemble. They have the court assembly, they call people from the neighborhood and come to the courthouse. Call them out. They have sports assembly. They call everybody from around the country, around the area. Come on, come on, come to the game. Come to the sports activity. It's a called out assembly. But, but, but this one's different. This called out assembly belongs to Christ. It's 
his church. Somebody say amen. amen. He called out his assembly. He called out his church from this world to another world, from darkness to light, from sin to forgiveness, from unrighteousness to righteousness, from bondage to liberty, from condemnation to justification, from eternal death to eternal life. They're called out. Praise his name. <laughs> I guess it ought to be obvious, another obvious. Everybody's not in his church. That's just not very nice. That is not nice. Everybody should be able to be in this church. Well, since you brought it up, it is open to whosoever will. Whosoever will do what? Whosoever will answer the call of the gospel of Christ. So, here comes another obvious. If it's, only op if it's open to everybody, but they have to answer the call of the gospel of Christ, here's another obvious. Evidently, there's some qualifications, requirements. If you want to be part of his church, there are some requirements. The requirement, number one, they must be saved, born again, regenerated, redeemed. I can argue. Right. Well, that sounds restrictive. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, that sounds like a wall. Sounds like to me you're building a wall, not letting people in the church. Well, since you brought it up, evidently it is. There are some people who try to sneak in, and it doesn't do them any good. There's only one door, one door to salvation, and that's Jesus Christ. It's not what people think or what they desire or how they feel about it. There is requirements to be part of his church. The next requirement is baptism. I did pronounce it correctly. Baptism. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand the confusion about baptism. The word itself means to dip, to plunge, to immerse, to place into. The only baptism known or seen in the scriptures is burial in deep water. This is not baptism. This is not baptism. <laughs> That's baptism. They went, they both went down into the water. So we're getting it, I think. There's got to be a proper candidate. They must be born again. Since you brought it up, just because this happened to you doesn't mean you're in the church. Amen. You've got to be born again. If you weren't born again, and they did take you to the baptistry, and they did do this to you, you didn't get baptized because you got to get born did again did first did. You just got wet. You need to be baptized. Now, now, now these are not mine and your rules to decide how we want to do it. The Ethiopian said, well, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, 
thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Anybody hear that? There's another obvious. Babies can't get baptized. No, they can get wet. They can't be baptized. But they cannot believe with all their heart. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Hmm. So you have to have the proper candidate saved. You have to have the proper mode in deep water. But you know, that's not really all there is to it. Because you also have to have proper authority. Baptism by a friend is not baptism. <laughs> baptism by someone with false doctrine is not baptism. Amen. Baptism by someone who says they are called of God is not baptism. Christ did not chart, start his church and leave it here with no instructions. The authority to conduct his ordinances were not left up to any Yehu to do what they wanted to do. He gives us his instructions. Some spiritual giants would complain and say, Oh, now you're going to talk about ordinances. Those are rules, aren't they? Those are more laws, aren't they? They're restrictive. I don't like rules. I prefer to do the way it fits me. The way is most comfortable for me. You know, God loves me. And he doesn't fence me in with some of your stupid rules. Well, I'll just tell you that if they were my rules, they may very well be stupid. But these are not mine. These belong to the Savior, and it's his church. The ordinance is a law or regulation made by a city or a town or a government. But the definition continues and says this. Ordinance is an authoritative decree. And I'd say Jesus Christ has the authority to make a decree. And his decrees are two. The Lord's table and baptism. Since we're talking about it, what's been said about baptism, you can say about the Lord's table. You don't get to do it how you want to. You don't get to decide who's going to take it and who doesn't. Since we started off like this, I'll just go ahead and say it now. It's a local Amen. church. Amen. Well, I just don't see it like that. So? <laughs> it's the church at Antioch. Amen. The most we know about the Lord's table is from Corinthians. It's the church at Corinth. You don't have the right to come over to Southwest Baptist Church where I'm a member and start telling people what to do. Or You don't have any business to do there. Or you can come and enjoy it, but you're not part of that body. <laughs> Baptism was commanded to be, it's part of the Great Commission of Matthew 28. Baptism is not a suggestion. It's an ordinance given by the Lord himself. You don't pray about getting baptized. Uh, I just... <clears throat> <laughs> I've been in the ministry a long time now. I've been coming here 27 years. I've been in the ministry now for 46 years. And I've had several people... Uh, I'm going to pray about getting baptized. <clears throat> Did you get saved or not? It's an ordinance. You don't decide if it's for you. You don't baptize yourself. You don't decide who's going to baptize you. You submit yourself to the authority of his church. 
The Lord did not leave it up to us. The authority to baptize was given to his church in Matthew 28. Oh, now, wait a minute, Brother Dave. I believe he was talking to individual Christians there. Now, if he was talking to individuals, when they all died, the commandment would have died with them. If it was individuals, they would have to fulfill the other order of the church. What do you mean? Well, they would have to assemble by themselves. They would have to pastor themselves. They would have to collect offerings on the first day of the week by themselves. They would have to gather by themselves to commemorate the Lord's table. They would have to teach biblical doctrine to themselves so they could be grounded in the faith for themselves. They would have to honor themselves and prefer themselves before themselves. They would have to have compassion and love to themselves. That's all foolish. A third grader understands that's not right. The command, the commission is to his church to take the gospel to sinners all over the world. Mercy. The function of the church has many facets. These we know for sure. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy. The church is to go into all the world with the gospel, preaching, teaching, baptizing, discipling, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. The church is to bring glory to God throughout all ages. Ephesians. Let me just do a parenthesis here. If the church is going to bring glory to God throughout all ages, we can be sure that no matter how bad we mess up, the Lord's church is going to keep on going. It might be a remnant. And in these United States, it does seem like it's a remnant. But that doesn't change any doctrine. Just like in the beginning... And uh, in Europe, when our forefathers were burned and drowned, poked through the face with a burnt stick to mark them, that still goes on today. If that begins to happen, I'll just tell you, you and I might not have the guts to do it, but his church will continue. How do I know? It's throughout all ages. Praise his name. So we discovered the work of the Lord is he came to do the Father's will. He came to seek and to save. He came to call sinners to repentance, and he came to build his church. So he started his church to continue his work. It's illustrated and defined in the book of the Acts of the Apostles and in all the epistles. We're going to look at two. The first one we've already read in Acts 13. Did you notice it says that these men, it gives their names, and it says in verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord. They were serving the Lord. They weren't serving each other. They weren't trying to get the community all involved. They were serving the Lord, doing it His way. busy, willing, humble, surrendered. Then it says, the Holy Ghost said, I'll just say it like this, God said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have, listen to these words, called them. I'm just here to remind you that God still calls people. He's still calling his servants to continue his work. I know that it's possible that it might not always be in a church setting, 
But I'm telling you, that's where God gets his servants. From a church that is ministering, serving him. And in this room tonight, it's very, very likely that God's kind grace that he's calling you tonight. He said, I want you. Brother Menick and his wife are dear friends to my daughter and son-in-law. And then their kids play together and they love each other and see each other. My kids came out here on vacation last summer and they said, we have to go to 29 Palms. And they came back and they told, Dad, you won't believe what their ministry there is precious. And they just spoke about the ministry to those servicemen. Brother Menning's right. I've said it hundreds of times, at least scores of times, to young people across this country as I've preached at different places. If God will let someone like me be in his work, you don't have an excuse. I know we make fun and joke about that and so on, but it's a true statement, friend. I don't deserve to say his name out loud, let alone stand in front of people that love him and serve him and preach his word. But by his grace and his kindness, I get to do this. And I'm telling you, you cannot sit there and act like, well, God would never call me. Well, that's exactly what I said. There's no way he would call me. He doesn't call you because you are awesome. He calls you because he is awesome. He's got something for you to do. Don't say no to him. A young preacher a few years ago, I appreciate what he had to say. We don't need more Christian doctors and more Christian lawyers and more Christian plumbers. We need more servants in the field. God is calling, and people aren't saying yes. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not against Christian lawyers and doctors and plumbers and carpenters. I'm for them. I thank God there's many of them. We wouldn't have anybody to preach to. But don't sit here at night and act like, well, we really need another Christian lawyer. What we need is more missionaries, more servants that will do the work of the Lord. And since you brought it up, he will call you. And his call will be evident. You won't be scratching your head going, I'm not sure if he's calling me or not. If you're not sure, you're not called. If he's calling you, you will know it. God is not hindered by mine and your stubbornness and our stupidity. He can still get it across. Thank God for his mercy and grace. It says, they, in verse number three, they had fasted and prayed. Who, who is they? Who is these they people praying and fasting? Well, in verse one it tells you. The church that was at Antioch. They prayed. They laid hands on them. That doesn't mean they, they grabbed them by the neck and collar and threw them out. It's the precious joy of someone being ordained. Ordained, this means set apart. Not a novice, but set apart to the work of the Lord. Verse 3, it says, when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them. Listen, look at this. It says, they sent them away. You know, they are the only ones with the authority to send them away. Who, who is they? Uh, it's the church at Antioch. The church has the authority with the ordinances. So the church is the one with the authority to send them away. Individual Christians don't have the authority 
You don't have the authority to do the Lord's Supper with your buddies out in the woods. You don't have the authority to do the Lord's table in the hospital with your friend. We were sitting at the table last night wherever the gym is or somewhere. And it just came up. There's a fellow in here that he's preaching in a um, snowbird park. Doesn't mean they all wear white. A snowbird park. And so he preaches them because their preacher, anyway, so they, they, got, they ask him, he preached. And then so the people go, uh, we want to do the Lord's Supper. We do it the last Sunday of every month. And this preacher in this room said, well, that would not be biblical. And here's what, here's what the people say. Well, the other guy was really not a pastor. He was just like us. So he really didn't have the authority, but you did. Well, he don't. The church has the authority. Is anybody hearing me? You can't do it your way. The Kiwanis, the Shriners, the Elks, the Moose, the Rabbits, the Convention, the King, the Potentate, the Government, the Fellowship, your mama and your daddy don't have the authority. His church has the authority. The church sent them away. Oh, where'd they go? Away. What they do? The work. Well, what work? The work the Holy Ghost wanted them to do. And the Holy Ghost, remember, he's triune God. So the work would be the work that Jesus did. What's that? Save sinners. Build the church. That's the work part of us and soul were sent to do. Oh, since we're talking about it. The church sent them to do what? To do the work. What work? The work that Jesus started and he commissioned his church to do. Well, who did he give the commission to? Uh, the church. Who sent them away? The church. Why? It's their responsibility. The Holy Ghost called them, the church sent them. Who, 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 who do you think funded this mission trip? The people who are responsible funded it. Barnabas and Saul didn't say, hey, don't worry about it, we got lots of money. The church said, hey, Barnabas and Saul, don't worry about this. We're going to take care of you and we're going to send you away. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the church's responsibility to fund, to finance missions. Stop being tight-fisted. Open up your hand and give so missions can go around the world. Amen. Tonight we heard the heartbeat of the Minnick family. Brother Webster, tears in his eyes, says, get behind them. Don't you see their heart? And many of you have already forgotten. Say, well, yeah, I probably ought to support them. But I don't know. The truth is that many of you, before they leave this meeting, you ought to go up to them and say, I'm going to send you a thousand. I'm going to send you 2,000. I want you to get that building. I want you to fix it up. Those Marines are worth it. How many have to be worth it? If you were the Marine and you were the only one, I'd say you wouldn't care how much it cost. I'm sick of us crybabies trying to delineate God's business. Is it worth it? Does it add up? If I'm the lost soul, it's worth it. Mercy. Open up your heart. Open up your hands and give. It's our job to send them. Okay, one other passage. It shouldn't take more than an hour. <laughs> one Corinthians, please. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm just trying to give you illustration, an example about the church and the work. And I know, I know, I know, I've, I've sat where you sat where you go, I think you did pretty good right there. You could quit and we could take care of the business. Well, that's the thing about building these sermons. Sometimes they just keep on growing. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 3, please. Paul writing to the Corinthians, he said, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while, while one saith, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? For then, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. These Corinthians have got the wrong attitude and the wrong motive for their service. Well, I actually follow Apollos. This is how we do it. Well, I'm telling you, you kind of messed up. I'm, I follow Paul. And he's a man of God. You remember how he preaches? Mercy. wish all of you could have been here this morning. Both messages were incredible. Really a blessing. Really, really a blessing and a help. Brother Wayne Hardy showed us this morning. You know, serving Apollos, serving Paul, Mm, got the wrong deal. You need to serve him. Paul is teaching the individual person is not what's important. Paul, Apollos, we're 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 nothing. I don't know if you heard the word or not. He said, so neither is he that planteth anything. That sounds like he's nothing. He might be able to sit next to your brother old barrel and say, hey, I'm a zero too. <laughs> Not very many of us would tag Apollos or Paul as a zero. But Paul says, we're not anything. It's God, it's God, it's God. Mercy. God is the one that accomplishes the work. If there's going to be work done that honors and glorifies Him, it will be by Him, through Him, in Him, with Him. It's not you. Stop bragging. Stop it. It's not you. On the other side, stop whining. It's not you. There's no reason to get the big head and think you are more important. God's not impressed. God is not great because of you. And there's no reason to feel puny and unimportant. God doesn't pity you or feel sorry for you. God is not great or less great because of you. No one is more important. No one is less important. 
and God's work. It's amazing to me. I know I grew up in a preacher's home and I saw preachers and I looked up to them and I revered them and respected them and I go, ooh, they're a big preacher. Ooh, they're an important preacher. Then I go to Bible college and Bible college was at its zenith. We had these named preachers come and whoa, he's a, he's a great preacher. He's a big preacher. Ooh, he's got a big ministry. In our humanity, we give them a claim. God doesn't. God doesn't say, uh, J.T. McCracken guy's got about 40 people there. And this guy's got 6,000. God doesn't say, yeah, he's more important. Not God. God says, uh, you're not anything, Bubba. Excuse me, you're not anything either, Bubba. <laughs> I'm the one that's everything. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice this phrase in here. Um, let's see. There it is, verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth, they're the same. They're one. Every man shall receive his own reward. Now look what the scripture says. According to his own labor. Now that's uh, a little more pointed. It does say according to his own labor. Oops. Evidently there are degrees of labor. According to his own, excuse, is anybody with me on this? Yeah, there's degrees of labor. No, no, everyone's the same. No, everyone's not the same. Because everyone does not labor the same. But I am not supposed to feel guilty or less valuable if my ministry is not as broad or not as well known as yours. But I may be convicted if I have been lazy and I didn't work as hard as you. It's not my business to make sure you work as hard as I do. It is my business to make sure that I work as hard as I can for the Savior. I'm not working for you. I'm not preaching for you. I'm not living for you. It's for Him. Stop whining. I'm weary with whining preachers. And you don't know what we have to go through. Well, maybe you're getting the wrong reward. I just, you just really need to listen to both messages we heard this morning. I would like to preach them, but I've already pretty close to the limit. I just want to show you my favorite part. Look at the verses. Verse 9. For we are laborers Together with God. That's incredible. I'm not only working with you, and I love rubbing shoulders, and I love shaking hands, and I love hugging you, and laughing with you, praying with you, working with you, and I'm glad, I'm glad that I get to work with you, but I'm not only laborers with you, I am a co-laborer with God. Mercy sakes. Uh, I've got five brothers. The oldest one in the family is my brother, and he's six years older than me. So when I was 10, he was 16. He quit school and went to work. When he was 17 and a half, he joined the Army. When I was in the ninth grade, I'm 15, I'm going to turn 16. We moved to Pee Valley, Kentucky, and we were poor. We rented an old farmhouse on 80 acres. Nope, we didn't get the 80 acres. We just got like a little acre. The 80 acres was rented out, leased out to farmers. Sometimes there was cattle. Sometimes there was hay. We lived in the old, old, old farmhouse. 
set a glass of water in January in your bedroom, in the morning you'd have ice. This idea of working co-labors with God, my brothers, dad wanted to feed the family, and so in the month of April, he found an old hand push plow. He's going to plow, well, as much as he can. And I would imagine it was a, a quarter of an acre. And if you don't know how much a quarter of an acre is, it's about as big as this room. He's going to plow it with a, a push plow. Not a, they didn't have an electric motor on it, no gas motor. No, 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 no. Had a wheel about this big around on it. It's all rusty looking. The oak wood coming up to make the handles was all gray. There was two implements you could attach to it. One was a three-pronged scratcher thing. <laughs> One was a curved disc, like a plow, and you would stick it in the ground and push it, and then make the dirt come over. Anyway, he got it all plowed up with uh, our help. I'm serious. He, he tied a rope to that plow, attached it. And me and my brother, who's two years younger than me, he's a lot smaller than me, and back then I was just 15 years old, probably weighed 125 pounds, 20 pounds, this little skinny stick. And we're out there, we got the rope around our chest, and we're pulling that plow. <laughs> my mom, glory to God, she's a godly lady. She wanted to save us. JT, JT, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought, praise God, she's going to tell him, don't make these boys do that. She said, I brought them a towel. Let them put it on where they won't get a rope burn. <laughs> Dad planted green beans. I'm talking, there's a big rows of green beans. And then he planted taters. There were some tomatoes, and there were some cucumbers, there were some uh, squash, but it was, it was new potatoes and green beans. Some corn, but new potatoes and green beans. So it became my job, because I'm 16, I'm a man, <laughs> to weed, hoe out the green beans rows, and then we had to pick them. And green beans don't grow up chest high. They weigh down there. You got to get on your knees and looking around in there. You got to get the big ones. You can't get the little ones. You got to get the big ones. If you get the little ones, you get slapped in the head. <laughs> we need the big ones. So me and my two brothers, one's two years younger than me, one's three years younger than me, we are picking the green beans. It's our job to hoe the green beans and pick them. These two goobers, I'm 16, he's 14, he's 13, and they, after five minutes, they're messing around. We got to get it done. Dad's coming home. We got to hoe the green beans. We got to thin out or pick the green beans. And these goobers are messing around. But I know, and they know, when Dad gets home, if it's not done, they're not the ones going to get in trouble. <laughs> we all are. And I'm telling you, I never one time said, I love picking green beans with my brother. <laughs> I couldn't tell Dad, Dad, this is my row, and that's what they're doing. <laughs> no, no, we were re I was responsible for all of it. I hated it. 
My mom can. I don't know where she got all the quart jars from, but she can green beans and potatoes, new potatoes in these quart jars. It seemed like a hundred. I don't know, but we had green beans and potatoes all winter long. We had it two meals a day. That's what we had. And God sustained a cracking family. But here's what I'm mad about. My brothers. <laughs> I don't want to work with them. They're stupid. They're lazy. They're playful. They're throwing dirt clods. They're, I don't know what they're doing. We got work to do. But I will tell you with all my soul, when I found out I was a co-laborer with God, I'm not afraid to go to work. I'm not ashamed to go to work. I'm not depending on me. I'm depending on Him. Mercy, what are you whining about? You're a co-laborer with God. What are you bragging about? It's not because of you. It's because of God. Oh, why are you lazy? Don't you know who's working with you? Get up. Get to work. Mercy. What is wrong with us? Whining and whippering around as if we can't get the work done. And God is our partner. I love what one preacher said. If God be your partner, make your plans large. Amen. To be involved in the Lord's work and the Lord's church is holy ground. We're partners with God. We're co-laborers with God. We should be full of thanksgiving. He brought us to this point. His mercy and grace, His salvation, long-suffering, His forgiveness, the opportunity just to serve Him in His work. We should be full of surrender. What is wrong with us? We should be full of obedience. We should be available to whatever he wants. No arguments. No discussion. No debate. Just humble surrender to anything. Everything. Wherever he wants us to go. Whatever he wants us to give. The young people sang this morning, any road at any cost. Do you accept the responsibility to do the work of Christ his way? Are you surrendered to do your part in Christ's church to continue his work? Are you committed to be involved in getting the gospel of Jesus to sinners? Home and abroad. Do you understand that we're co-laborers? We're not on our own. If God be our partner, we can do his work. So tonight I ask you, are you willing to go anywhere? Are you willing to give anything? If you're not yet saved, the Savior, Jesus Christ, wants to forgive you. Just to say, just to say you're a church member doesn't mean you got saved. Just because you've been baptized doesn't mean you get to go to heaven. The Holy Ghost will speak to your heart about salvation. Amen. The Holy Ghost will speak to your heart about his call that he's putting on your life. The Holy Ghost will bring conviction to me and you about, are we really doing his work his way? I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We could bow our heads. I would pray with you. Dear God in heaven, I come to you again. Thank you. Thank you for instruction. Thank you that we're not on our own. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving me. and Thank you for touching my life to call me 
to the work. God, you're still calling people today. I thank you that you still do it. Thank you you gave us good instructions about your work. It's your way. God, I pray that we'd have yielded, humbled, surrendered hearts. Our heads are bowed. Brother Vic's going to begin the invitation. If you want to sing with him, you're welcome to. If you need to respond tonight, the Holy Ghost is massaging your heart or touching your heart. I invite you to say yes. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning Join me, still I will follow. No, no one join me, still I will follow. No, no one join me, still I will follow. No turning verse came to my heart, especially to preachers, people that have been called by God. If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is not our flock. It is his, his sheep. He purchased it with his blood. We don't own it, and we have to behave. We have to act right in the Lord's house. Brother McCracken, thank you for the message. God bless my soul. I'm glad that somebody passed that truth on to me. When I got saved. It was in a Sunday school. It was behind this pulpit. And when I went to a Bible college, it was the same stuff. I mean, it was, that's the truth that endured to all generations. Thank you again, Brother McCracken. But David's going to come up here to give some announcements. I'd like to ask Pastor Abel's to come up here also to close us with a word of prayer. Brother David. Good evening. A couple quick announcements. If you're picking up your children, please exit through those double doors back there to my left and your right. We will, uh, there's a big entrance over there so you could pick up your kids. If you parked in the South Bay parking lot, our last shuttle run will be at 930. If you can do, pick up your cars over there uh, as soon as possible, that would be great. Uh, many of you have been asking, where's the lumpia? Where's the pancit? Well, yeah. we have a treat for you tonight. Uh, yeah. Tonight we will be having that, our, our, uh, since it's uh, beyond the region's international dinner emphasis. Uh, so please, uh, our GIBF guests, as soon as you enter the gym, those first two tables is designated for you. For our church members, please go to your right. So there's no confusion there. And please, uh, once again, let our guests go first. We do have a field trip tomorrow for the children, so don't forget to turn in the permission slip over to the registration table. We have plans to go to the Birch Aquarium, but if God brings the rain tomorrow, we will have a nearby venue. Lastly, please bring everything with you. To you to your Bibles, your bags. Uh, we do have cleaners that go through the seats, and we want to make sure that nothing is missing and that everything is clean and in order. And I believe that's all the announcements, Pastor. We've been blessed. Tremendously. Thank you, Brother O'Barrow, Brother Serrano. Thank you so much. We'd like to invite you to the next meeting, which will be in September in Springfield, Missouri, at Berean Baptist Church. We look forward to hosting it, and uh, we hope that you'll come and be a part of the meeting. You can check on, uh, for hotels and everything on our website. Uh, we've already made preparation. We've already got uh, hotels uh, ready, 
And so please make those as soon as possible. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of things uh, to do as far as the area. We got Branson about 45 minutes south of us. We have Bass Pro. We have one of the best aquariums that's ever been built right uh, in Springfield, Missouri. And those all things are fine, but we're looking more for the meeting and the preaching and the fellowship. But we do have Andy's frozen custard in Springfield. So you don't want to miss that, all right? And I do believe tonight I learned why Brother McCracken is the way he is. He, he, he picked too many short green beans. <laughs> you never know what you'll learn in these meetings. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the heart of this church and the heart of this pastor. Thank you, Lord, for missions. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. And Lord, we have so much more to do before you're coming. Help us to be reminded that we are to give, that we are to send. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the admonition tonight about the church. It is about your work. And God, I thank you that we're able to be involved in your work, doing it your way for the honor and the glory of our Savior. God, may we do the labor. May we work. May we do your business. I pray that you would bless the food tonight, the fellowship that we'll be able to enjoy. In Christ's name, amen. amen.